Welcome, everybody, to this Circle of Fellows broadcast, podcast, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm Shell Holtz. I am the host of the uh, Four Immediate Release podcast and the FIR Podcast Network. And I have a panel of fellows today to talk about the customer experience and the role of organizational communications in delivering on the customer experience. I should note that the customer experience is the April content theme for IABC and Circle of Fellows is now going to uh, sync up with the monthly content theme. So next month we'll be talking about creativity and innovation uh, and I think uh, building your career is on the agenda. Bunch of good topics so uh, I think we'll be able to enhance the conversation going on in communication world and other IABC channels. But uh, we're going to talk about the customer experience today. And with me are Brad Whitworth, uh, George McGrath, and Jim Schaefer. Uh, how you doing, gentlemen? Doing great. Terrific. So the customer experience, I think, is probably important that we need uh, to define the term before we uh, start talking about it. and. Um, Tell me if you disagree with this, but uh, when I hear about the customer experience, it's distinct from experiential marketing. Uh, and it's really the cumulative impact of every time a customer touches the organization, whether it's advertising and marketing, uh, looking for information in a search, calling customer support, calling tech support, uh, dealing with a salesperson, buying the product, using the product. Uh, all of this rolls up into the customer experience and in order to create this customer experience, a very positive one, you need to be mindful of the customer at every stage of their journey with the organization from becoming aware of the organization through uh, possibly becoming a, a brand ambassador for the organization. Is, is that your thinking? Do you have other definitions? No, I, th I think that's, uh, this is Jim, I, I think that's absolutely correct. It's uh, when we do our customer satisfaction or customer experience measurement, we're measuring all the different encounters or touch points that exist between the customer and ourselves. So I think you've uh, defined it exactly the way I would. I think the other piece is that it is such a broad topic that it's sometimes difficult for communications people in general to be able to put their hands or their minds around it and realize that uh, this is something that I mean, you, you touch a portion of it through, through some of the traditional communications mechanisms, but it is much, much bigger. And I think we can play that catalyst role that you described in being able to pull things together. Right. And, and of course, you know, it's a, it's a cross-functional uh, type of an issue because you might have a great experience with the sales team when you're buying the product. Uh, think about, for example, <laughs> buying a new car. Uh, when you need to take it in for service, you might have a completely different experience, even though it's the uh, automaker and their relationship with the dealer uh, that's delivering the service. So you know, from an organizational standpoint, uh, it's, it's tough to assign ownership of the customer experience since so many different parts of the organization contribute to that. Um, is there a role that we can play in, in coordinating that customer experience across different silos in the organization? Well, I think absolutely. I think that's what we're there for. I don't mean communication people, but I think if everybody in the organization has a responsibility to the customer, then they have some touch point or encounter uh, that they have with that customer. I don't think it's about a department and how a department uh, treats the customer. But there are huge opportunities, as Brad said, uh, for people who are knowledgeable about communication, and I don't mean just about uh, formal channels, but communication in the broadest sense, to help um, drive the brand on the external side and uh, cause the organization to be able to deliver on the internal side. In fact, our, our work that we did with FedEx was to integrate the external and internal communication functions so that the external people were focused on delivering the purple promise, which in FedEx talk, that means uh, I will deliver an outstanding performance every opportunity that I have. And at the same time, you have the, uh, so they're building the brand promise while the internal people are knocking down communication defects or barriers that are preventing people from delivering that promise. Well, I think to build on your point, Jim, the other thing I see is that uh, the communications folk 
by and large, are the ones who are worried about this vast array of audiences, those broad constituencies, with probably the the charter of or the hope to bring them all together um, and see them in a holistic fashion so that whether you're talking to employees, or you're talking directly to customers, or you're talking to you know, influence uh, leaders out there, opinion thought leaders, uh, local citizenry, government, you know, we're the ones who can sort of see the discrepancies in all of this, whether it's something that we control perhaps, you know, with like an outbound channel of some sort, or we're probably the ones who are spending a lot of time looking at things like social media where you're you're really looking at what is the buzz, what is the conversation. So I do think that we have, um, I don't necessarily call it an obligation, but we're probably one of the few places in an organization that's trying to look at all these constituencies and see if there's a consistency and point out when we're not doing a good job. Yeah, you, you mentioned looking at social media. I think that's uh, become a, a de facto place where people go to complain when they're having a, a bad experience. Uh, but it's also a place where people go to ask questions. Uh, and I think monitoring social media and looking for the questions that uh, our stakeholders, our customers uh, are, are asking and being able to either craft content or jump into conversations and, and deliver an answer certainly enhances that experience. Uh, George, are, are, are your clients you know, out there looking for what kind of questions and issues their customers have? Well, we work with some very large consumer products companies, and all these companies have got uh, very deep uh, social media monitoring and engagement uh, capabilities. I've got one company I work with, Kimberly Clark, has got about 50 people on an ongoing basis every day, monitor, you know, engaging, monitoring, and conversations on social media around all their brands. And if there's an issue that comes up with the brand, with a customer, there's a deficit between what the brand promises and what it delivered to a particular customer, they get engaged directly with the customer and the, or the consumer and say, hey, look, talk to me. Let's talk direct about this and try to deal with your issue. So that's certainly in I think most you know, large organizations these days have got that capability. If you're in a smaller organization, uh, smaller business, obviously you don't, you may not have 50 people working for the whole organization, let alone 50 working to uh, monitor social media, but you can still draw down some of the uh, discipline, the approaches these big organizations make to your efforts. So for example, looking at the conversations that are happening around your product and services, when someone's got an issue, reaching out to them very quickly and saying, hey, you seem to have a problem with our product, we undershot our promise here. Let's take this offline and talk about it and resolve your problem. So it doesn't just keep metastasizing and spinning around in social media and getting a bunch of people jumping in saying, yeah, I had that issue too, or why doesn't the company do something about this? Yeah, I think, I think where the communication people have a tremendous opportunity, aside from social media, is in the operations of the business where the money gets made. Uh, in particular, in sales, let's say, where I was working with an organization recently, and the salespeople didn't have information that they needed to be able to um, uh, talk about whether to, the, to, to what extent they were uh, going to have new products uh, into the market to the, the clients or customers. Uh, they didn't have information about features and benefits, and as a result of that, they were losing sales. So I think communication people can help close that communication gap, which causes the revenues to go up. Same with on-time delivery in a manufacturing plant that Courtney Reynolds, who's a communication person at Northwestern Mutual, was able to help. Moving through the process of delivering uh, the product, there were a lot of drop balls and there were communication defects that were occurring. As a result of that, she, working with me, improved on-time delivery by about 45%. Again, communication people getting into the business where the business makes money. R&D in a pharmaceutical, shortening the timeline that it goes through FDA's uh, pipeline. Uh, all are opportunities for people to get into the business of the business, and I'm, I'm just really pleased to see so many more communication people doing that. Yeah. Uh, before we go on, I do want to let uh, anybody watching live know that you can ask questions uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen. There should be a place where you can submit questions, and we'll answer those. I'm also monitoring a hashtag, uh, hashtag IABCFellows. 
so if you want to ask the question there, if that's easier, go right ahead and, and we'll tackle those. Uh, Jim, you raise a, a, a really interesting point, and, and one of the things that I see that's missing in a lot of organizations uh, is an effort to educate employees about other parts of the business. Uh, you know, you pick up the phone and, and you call the company and, and you have a question or an issue, and the answer you get is, uh, I don't work in that part of the business, I don't know anything about that. Uh, you know, the, as, as, as the customer, you're inclined to think it's, it's one organization. Uh, but I think one of the roles that we can play is, is in that business literacy uh, aspect of things to help people understand what other parts of the organization are doing. I know over at IBM they have developed uh, the Think Academy uh, and a lot of employees are very, very engaged in this and it's a place where you go to learn the company strategy uh, and uh, ask questions and, and uh, basically build confidence in yourself to be able to talk about this when people ask what is Watson uh, and what's going up with Watson and what are you, what, what's your strategy in terms of leveraging that for profitability or you know what is IBM doing in cloud computing um, and I think 95 percent of employees are, are, are using Think Academy to be able to talk articulately about what's going on in, in their organization. Um, is uh, do, do you guys see uh, other organizations making an, an effort to that degree to educate employees about the company's overall strategy and, and the various you know, business efforts that are underway in, in, in order to drive profitability and be able to talk intelligently about that to their audiences? Yeah, I, I certainly do. I think that one of the things that, I, that I'm seeing a lot, a lot of is a translation of the business strategy out into the organization so people understand what line on the, operator, on the operating income line, uh, where, uh, where they sit and how they can influence that. So I think there's a lot more um, financial um, education going on, business acumen education. I think there's a, a bigger piece too that, that you raised, uh, Shell, and that is why do we have these departments out there that don't know um, what the other departments are doing. It doesn't seem like that's organizing around the customer. I see more and more organizations today organizing around value streams which are driven off of the customer and so I think in those organizations there's much more connectedness between the people in the organization and the customer. We probably in communication ought to be guiding our leadership about the problems that exist when you are segmented like the way you described. Well, that's an interesting question about the, the organization and the structure because, you know, I, I now work at Cisco and for many years worked at HP, and I think sometimes the bigger you get and the more global you get and sometimes the more diverse the product lines get, you do have a difficulty because not every customer is interested in buying the entire bag. So if you do have a customer focus in one part of the business, it's hard for people over there, whether that's geographically or business unit wise, to be knowledgeable. The one thing that I've seen recently, and you know, Shell, you probably are familiar with this, there's a, a, a great group called StarMind that are doing some knowledge management skill sets and in a sense um, taking that um, existing knowledge that employees have and, and putting it into a database that gets the answers to the most commonly asked questions uh, it's sort of like what you were describing with IBM and then codifying it, collecting it so that if you have a question, you go into this giant search engine thing and it knows the answers that are sort of coming from around the world. So uh, I guess I look at it as a, uh, as a great way to supplement the what it is you can pick up that uh, you need to know. And I think in a smaller organization, you, know, you definitely need to be tied into the core set of stuff that you're doing. As it expands, you have to start to get shallow. You can't expect everybody in the organization to know everything about every product and every market everywhere. But what you can expect them to know is where to go to find out that information. Right. And I think the other piece is um, that you sort of point out is we need to teach people to be those ambassadors and take ownership for this stuff instead of going, I don't know. Well, and part of that is empowering the frontline employees too to make to make decisions when something happens. I mean, if you if you have you, so you have to as the communicators also be looking at the policies that may be getting in the way of g good customer service. If it's I can't decide that I've got to flip it to a supervisor, or no, we don't take we don't take pro we don't take things back in the store if it's more if you had it for more than 15 days, you know, that's just that's just going to get in the way of providing that responsive level of customer service and excellence that people expect. 
Yeah, I, and Brad, I really agree with you uh, that, that the knowledge that every employee needs to have is, is if I don't know the answer to this, how can I get the customer to the right person who does? And you know, I see this in uh, a lot of employee ambassador programs uh, where uh, the, the employee, tr the, the training for the ambassador program is less about knowing everything, the answer to every question, uh, and, and more about getting the customer to the right person in the organization. I had an experience with Sprint, for example. I won't go into the uh, details about what the issue was, but I complained about it online, and somebody from Sprint said, well, that's not acceptable. Uh, let me help you. And she directed me to the right person who was able to resolve the issue. And uh, this was an issue that didn't get resolved after an hour on the phone with customer service. Uh, which leads me to ask um, how much an employee ambassador program can contribute to the customer experience. Have, have you seen any experiences with that? Well, I, I have seen uh, that. Uh, one of the large bottling groups has done it very, very successfully starting in Chicago. Um, I, I get a little concerned sometimes when we create programs or groups of people and don't focus on the people who are doing the jobs, doing it in the right way to begin with, so that it needs to be part of the overall organizational process. But yes, surgically attacking specific kinds of issues with ambassador programs, I think makes an incredible amount of sense. One of the things that uh, you know, we all know as a truism in this business is that people behave in ways for which they're compensated. And um, it'd be nice if, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm delighted, when I walked in at Cisco and found out that a part of every employee's bonus is based upon a customer satisfaction rating, and Cisco takes that very, very seriously and tracks this stuff religiously. So if you're a customer, you're constantly being asked, how are we doing, how are we doing, how are we doing? And then that gets factored into the pay for every employee not just the salespeople on the front line who are, in a sense, being rewarded by the dollars being voted on product sales, but you know, in every role. And that really helps set the culture that uh, makes things, you know, everybody should be an ambassador all the time. So how, how can you get that? And, then, and I think put in place what you're talking about too, which is some programs, some tools, some opportunities so that people can take that willingness and turn it into action steps. Brad, when you measure people on the customer satisfaction, are these things that people can influence, or is it the overarching customer satisfaction assessment? Um, the, the survey does a little bit of both. I mean, okay. the, it's actionable, certainly, in the sales side of things. They're asking some things that deal with, uh, you know, the how well, but then there is this overall measure that then gets plugged into everybody, no matter how far away. I mean, you could be sitting in accounting where you have little or no direct control, although um, you, you do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> accounts payable and uh, bills and all sorts of fun things. And so I think that uh, it, it's, it's nice when you have an organization that can put its culture into action. Is what you were talking about in terms of a brand. How do you take that brand, external brand expression and then live it internally as employees? Absolutely. I was uh, reading a list of uh, elements of, of, of experience marketing, and, and here again we're getting into the experiential uh, type of marketing as opposed to the customer experience, although you know, having a, a great experience certainly can contribute to the uh, overall customer experience, but one of the elements is brand personification. Uh, and, and I think there's certainly a role that we can play in helping people understand the brand story and uh, live that and, and express it in interactions with customers. You know who does that particularly well is uh, Victoria's Secret, um, one of the limited uh, companies. And what, what they do is they have a, what they call a tableau room over in Columbus, Ohio. And in that room, they create a persona for each one of their various brands. Uh, let's take Victoria's Secret. And what they do is they identify what this Victoria's Secret person is like and give about 200 different what-ifs. What would Victoria do? in given situations. That then defines the brand and everybody in the organization understands if somebody comes in and they go into the dressing room and comes out and they're obviously in clothes that they shouldn't be in because they got them off the rack, what would Victoria do? It's a very, very nice way to personify a brand. 
it's also interesting to see you could do something like that in a, you know B to C kind of environment. But what do you do with B to B? And around my neck of the woods, one of the things that I'm seeing is the, this effort to try to define who it is that makes the buying decision. And so we do a lot of things sometimes where there's a technical decision maker who's looking at the product capabilities and speeds and feeds and all that tech data, and also the business decision maker who's looking at the outcomes and trying to make sure that whatever it is that we're producing in terms of benefits and features is reaching out and hitting both of those audiences because they can be very, very complex. Sometimes they both work together, sometimes they don't, but uh, you know, identifying who the buyer is, who the consumer is of this, because unless you can define that, it's really hard to get to what is this experience. Right. How, how important do you think the experiential marketing element is in uh, influencing the whole overarching customer experience? Uh, you know, I, when, when I do a presentation uh, on the employee experience, which we'll get to in a little bit, I, I have two examples I give of what I consider to be great um, experiences that both happened because, as Brad, you mentioned earlier, uh, the employees are empowered to take action without having to you know, write a proposal or, or, or get permission. And, and my favorite of these involved Peter Shankman. I don't know if you know Peter or, or who he is. Uh, but he was on a flight coming back into uh, Newark, and uh, he, he tweeted, you know, he was on his laptop on the Wi-Fi, and, and he tweeted just kind of whimsically that he, he would uh, love a porterhouse steak from Morton's. Uh, he lands and, and he gets over to baggage claim and there's a guy in a tux holding a Morton's bag uh, with a porterhouse steak dinner. Uh, he was amazed by that. He, he took a picture and he tweeted it and that was seen by hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, amplified through retweeting. Uh, he also wrote a blog post about the fact that they did this and you know if you if you look at Peter's profile you see that he's an influencer he's got a lot of followers but then you start to look at some of the other things they're doing and, and they're doing it for people who don't have that kind of an audience there was a woman who t uh, tweeted that she was going to Morton's for her third anniversary dinner and when she got there uh, they had a special menu printed with her and her husband's name on it and the anniversary date and it was a keepsake and, and had some special items and I went and looked at her profile and she had about 200 followers on Twitter uh, but this is things these are things that these people talk about um, and, and that's really one of the goals of the experience isn't it is, is, is to get people talking about your organization and recommending it and, and uh, generally improving your net promoter score. Well, let's keep in mind the expectations for delighting customers is always increasing. Uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Robert Pasikoff, does a lot of research on branding and drivers of customer satisfaction. He's got a great quote, which is that when delight turns into expectation, that's when brands get into trouble. And the example is, think about the first time you went into a hotel years ago, and they put a couple of nice mints on your pillow. Well, that's nice. That makes this hotel different. Well, now the expectation has gone beyond mints on the pillow. Mints on the pillow, you get that everywhere, including Motel 6. Now I want a hot five-course breakfast is good, is good service. So the first time you went to, you saw somebody click a remote on the car and the doors open. Hey, that's cool. I want one of those cars. Now you get in the car, you're running low on gas, the car talks to you and says, you're running low on gas, can I find you a gas station? So the level of expectation is always, is always going up. And I think as marketers and communicators, we always got to keep a pulse on that and look for places where we can reach the, ne reach the next level of delighting the, delighting the customer. I mean, airlines are a great example. You know, years ago, it's like, Hey, I can now make an air phone call. I can make a phone call from the airplane. Now, the expectation is I want to stream movies on my iPad in the airplane. And by the way, I don't want to pay $9.95 for it. It should be free or included with the cost of the fare. So when you as an organization or a brand are not meeting that high level of expectation, that's when you start becoming a commodity. So you have to know where the bar is, right, and and be prepared to uh, rise to that level. But I, I think we're talking about two different things. I think one is uh, the expectation of the kind of service you're going to get, and, and the other is being surprised as an individual by something. Um, you know, the other example I share, uh, a guy uh, gets into his hotel room. Is this was at one of the Delta hotels in Canada, and uh, he finds that he's overlooking the the top of the garage uh, 
not a great view, and he tweets about that. Uh, and they tweet back from the hotel within minutes, uh, we'd love to upgrade your room for you and move you. And he said, yeah, I'm only here overnight. It's, it's okay. Uh, don't bother. He, he leaves and he comes back to his room and there's three pastries waiting for him with a personal note saying that they hope they'll be able to serve him better the next time he's there. Not something they had to do, but something an individual employee took upon themselves. And I, I, I think that's a cultural thing, isn't it? And it's uh, that empowerment that we were talking about earlier to, to take whatever step is necessary to create that great experience that the customer will talk about and, and uh, you know, basically uh, give the, the organization a good review that other people will pay attention to. I think that's one of the things that the Ritz Carlton has done for many years. They have a, a program with their uh, housekeeping staff. They give them X number of dollars. I don't know what it is today, but X number of dollars to step forward and serve and then step, spring back into their jobs. And they've always been um, empowered to step out of their role to help somebody who's coming down the hallway and looks lost. One of the things when we're doing customer experience uh, research is we want to make sure that we understand the different kinds of experiences that we have. For instance, we have environmental encounters. An environmental encounter has a great opportunity to, to irritate people but not much opportunity to um, delight people. It would be if I were to go to a hotel and uh, walk in the room, a hotel room, and the bed was made, I've never called my wife and said, boy, this is the best made bed I've ever, ever been in. But if I walked in the door and the bed wasn't made, I would be upset, angry, whatever. Uh, the assistance encounters, for instance, would be if I went to a New York hotel and I went down to the concierge when I just checked in and I said, I would like tickets to a show that starts in two hours. I know it's the number one show in New York. A great opportunity to delight me if he can do it or she can do it, uh, but I'm not going to be angry if they couldn't do it. So we have to understand the different four or five different kinds of encounters for uh, when we start making investments in what, where we try to delight and where we don't. One of the uh, topics that was a, a hot topic of discussion a couple of years ago and, and, and seems to have fallen off the radar is this idea of co-creation. Uh, but I think customers increasingly are expecting to have a voice uh, in the design of the product or, or what products are offered. Uh, and if, I think that's part of the experience, right? I mean, Dell, for example, uh, every year, it might be more than once a year, and I think Ford does the same thing, they fly in some of their biggest critics, and we're not talking about you know big thought leaders, just people who are online uh, haranguing about... Uh, the, the, the low quality of the product or whatever and, and, and they fly them in as a, as a group and, and spend a day with them talking about what we can do to improve the product uh, and I think you know, certainly that leads these individuals to go back and say hey they're listening uh, and, and I'm involved in helping uh, make this a, a better product that, that better serves our, our needs. Um, is, is, is that kind of embrace of the customer in terms of, of, of product design or product ideas, something that, that you're seeing much? I'd, I'd say definitely on the tech side of things, there are customer advisory panels of, of some of these crowds that will come in and help shape not only the product itself, but all sort of the services around it. And increasingly, I think, uh, you know, certainly in the tech part of the world, we're hearing about everything as a service. You know, no longer do you have to buy that piece of software and keep it on your machine. You can rent stuff out there in the cloud. Well, that service and that subscription, you how do you, you know, make sure that that's meeting the needs of? Well, you have advisory, you listen. I think the other piece that's very, very interesting is talking about sort of the, you know, not, not only the customer's influence in all this, but we were talking a little bit later about all these various constituent audiences one of the smart things that I've seen a number of tech companies do, we do it, Microsoft does it, is certified engineers, people who go out and take the training who can, I mean, part of it is their livelihood is based upon their ability to sell and service a, pro a certain line of products. Um, it, it's what you talked about in terms of even the dealerships and automobiles. I mean, they have a vested interest in succeeding with that. And if you can train these people, they become tremendous ambassadors if you can take care of that audience. And I think um, we see it at Cisco. We have a, a show every year called Cisco Live, which is a huge, in a sense, internal trade show. And we are, you know, 
bringing those sorts of folks in, and uh, it's like the Cisco groupies who are, are learning about the latest and the greatest and uh, getting a little bit of religion who can then go out and do this. So it's not only employees, it's not only the end user customer, it's some of these um, intermediaries, it's sort of the uh, audiences that can help influence and shape that overall experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this brings up a key point, which is you've got to understand the points of pain for your customers. What are the issues in their business that your product or service addresses? And that involves, you know, investing and in understanding particular needs of their business and and how you how you solve that issue for them. So, so for example, I'm working for with a company right now that supplies cleaning products to the aerospace industry. I mean, very mundane, everyday products. But they play it when they really dig into it. They play an essential role in improving the quality of paint jobs on an airplane. So why is that important? Because if you send out and repaint an airplane for JetBlue and it's got paint defects in it, they send it back to you in a couple of months and they say, "Guess what? Repaint that whole airplane for six hundred thousand dollars." It's on you, the vendor, to do that. So if you can bring, if you understand that as a supplier of cleaning products and you can offer products that prep the airplane surface better, you're solving a huge problem for that customer. And you're showing them you get their points of pain and, you got a, and you've got a solution that deals with it. You know, I think one of the places that, that uh, the customer experience tends to fall down is post-sales, right? It's, it's when the customer has bought the product and picks up the phone for support, uh, whether it's customer service or, or, or tech support. Where in call centers, uh, the way you're evaluated, the, the metric that they apply is how quickly can you get a customer off the phone uh, and how many of these calls can you deal with in a day. These are definitely seen as cost centers. Um, but you know, if you have a bad experience with, with tech support, that, that colors your whole perception of the organization. Is, is there a role, a role that communications can play in improving that? And Jim, I know that you've dealt with the, the call centers before. Yeah, I have. Uh, and um, they've actually changed their measurement uh, over a period of time. That, that What you were referring to is called handle time. That how long did it take to handle that case? Uh, and you, you also mentioned net promoter scores. They're also using that now. But the other one that they're using is the equivalent of manufacturing's first time through. Did the question get answered the, in the, in the, on the first phone call? How long did it take to get the question answered? So they're blending uh, the productivity of handle time uh, with did it work, did I answer your, your problem? I've always liked Zappos philosophy that we're a customer service company that happens to sell shoes and clothing product and you know if you've read Tony Shea's book or heard him speak uh, he doesn't care if a customer service rep spends an entire day on the phone with the customer as long as the customer's happy when the call is over but uh, your call is very important to us <laughs> well he's going to have an awful lot more people in the call center than maybe some right. well I don't think there are a lot of calls to take a whole day but uh, they're not rushing people to get customers off the phone, That's right. uh, but you know, the, the, I, I read a great story, and uh, it's out of Tony's book, so I, I'm going to assume that it actually happened. But uh, when they were completing the deal, the acquisition of Zappos by Amazon uh, in a hotel in in San Francisco, and it was like one in the morning, uh, and one of the the lawyers in the room says, uh, "I wonder where we can get a pizza this late," and and somebody said, "Well, if you call Zappos customer service, I'll bet they can help you." <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> the reaction was, well, that's ridiculous. Their their customer service for people who have bought products through um, Zappos, and uh, they said, Tony said, well, give it a try. So they picked up the phone, and you know, somebody answered over at, at Zappos, and uh, they said, hey, I'm in San Francisco in a hotel room. It's one in the morning. Where can I get a pizza? And there was just this this beat of of surprise over what the question was. And then she said, well, let me see what I can find for you. And within a minute, she had three different uh, places where they could call and order a pizza. Uh, yeah, that's something you'll talk about. You did, but <laughs> uh, you know we were talking earlier about every. And I do want to remind people who are watching live: you can ask your questions over on the right-hand side of the screen. There's a place to do that, or you can send your questions uh, through Twitter uh, using the hashtag #IABCFellows, and we'll be happy to take on. Uh, any questions that you may have about uh, the customer experience and the the role of um, communications in building and sustaining it. 
Uh, but we were talking about empowering employees and employee advocacy programs, and I know over at IBM, their view is that every IBMer is an employee advocate, an employee ambassador. Uh, they believe that the connection that customers and others have with the organization is always through an IBMer, uh, an individual. Most organizations, though, looking for more levels of control are creating these programs, uh, employee ambassador programs, where you have to raise your hand and say, I want to be part of this, uh, and then you go through training. And then in addition to, say, doing what they did at Sprint, which is trolling for people who are complaining and then helping them by getting them to the right uh, part of the company to resolve it, uh, they're also asking them to share content from the organization. Uh, do you think that these ambassadors have a have a role to play, the, the ones in these formal programs, uh, in building or sustaining the customer experience? Well, we talked about that a little bit ago. I think I think that uh, they do. Uh, I always caution uh, companies, though, of just let's create a program, an ambassador program, to take care of the customer experience um, when we have not built our cult culture around the customer. And my concern is, is we get into programs instead of processes, aligning our processes to make sure that everybody's focused on uh, the customer, like you said, IBM is, and certainly they're a good example of that. But what they do is they supplement the culture around the customer with those ambassador programs, as I said, to surgically uh, improve it even more. Culture is a really interesting issue, isn't it? Because I saw a study recently, they surveyed uh, a lot of people, uh, and it was uh, equal numbers, frontline employees, senior executives, and HR staff uh, from companies all over, I think it was all over the world. And, and what they found was that in each group, there was a different opinion about, first of all, who's responsible for defining the culture in the organization, and second, what are the top drivers of culture? And if you talk to senior management, uh, they said, we are the drivers of culture, and one of the top drivers uh, is a focus on the customer. You get to human resources and the frontline staff, uh, and, well, first of all, each of them believes that they're responsible for driving the culture. HR thinks they do. Uh, frontline employees think they do. But a focus on the customer is not a key driver for either HR or frontline employees. Uh, it seems to me that there is some work to be done around defining culture in the organization when you have this kind of disconnect. What did you say there about the first? What did you say about the first line not having a, a focus on the customer? I didn't understand that. The front line, uh, first of all, the front line believes that they drive the culture, they define the culture, uh, and when they were asked what they thought the key drivers of culture were, a focus on the customer didn't make the top three. I see. Uh, in, in, and nor, neither did it among human resources uh, staff. They thought uh, the key drivers were leaders who walk the talk. Um, Frontline employees also like leaders who walk the talk, but they, they think pay uh, is a key driver of, of culture. So uh, there's, I think, a misunderstanding among these three groups about what culture is, and I think they're all merrily uh, working along based on perceptions that aren't consistent across those, those three segments of the organization. But when you put them all together, they're right. <laughs> it is all those things. <laughs> it is all those things. <laughs> so it's a yes and a yes and a yeah. yes. To yes, be able to do yes. That. right. Well, I, th I think there are ways that, uh, Shell, you're sort of asking what influence can communications people play in that stuff. I think we can, again, sometimes be that constant reminder, helping shape things. One of the things that I'm delighted to see is when what would normally be an internal meeting, oh, let's have an all-hands meeting, let's have our quarterly review, let's do that they include a customer because it's so easy sometimes for organizations to you know, not have that voice of the customer. Um, I was delighted one time uh, to be invited to a meeting at Genentech, um, you know, Biopharma crowd, South San Francisco, and they are making life-saving you know, decisions all the time, drugs that can really improve people's lives. They actually have some of these people who, you know, just <laughs> they would not be on the face of the planet if it had not been for the, the drug that Genentech had developed. They will come and speak to employees. 
Now that's you know sort of a an over the top kind of uh, experience, but that really does connect you, no matter where you work in the organization, to what the end goal is, and make you realize and appreciate what it is that you're doing for them and they're doing for you. So. Um, that voice of the customer, whether it's an advisory panel, whether it's in a meeting that would normally be an internal one, or something specifically focused, I think can be that reinforcement that communications people can help shape that takes care of that culture, whether it's the HR people thinking this or the frontline people. We can help reinforce messages. Yeah, Brad, you the, uh, at AbV, where I've done a lot of work, at the biggest meeting that they have over and over again is when the voice of the patient comes into the room and talks about what Humira did for them or what one of the, their other drugs did for them. It's amazing the number of employees who are all headed down the hallway, headed for these conference rooms, like, like on the streets of New York to get there, and they are filled with the, hearing these people talk. It's a very powerful way. I've always said to uh, clients that I work with, when they're going to stand up and talk about what the, what the customer wants, what the customer wants, the best way to really get people emotionally involved is do exactly what you said. Bring the customer into the room and tell them, tell the employees, I'm very happy with what you did. Here's where you've disappointed me. I've never seen employees so sad walking out of a room and, and also interviewing jobs uh, to help take care of the customer better when it came from the customers versus the boss. Yeah, back in the uh, print days, uh, when I was with Allergan, we used to do a recurring monthly feature that was an interview with a customer, what they loved about doing business with us, what drove them crazy about doing business with us, uh, and what they liked and uh, what drove them crazy about doing business with our competitors. And uh, it was a remarkably popular feature. Mm -hmm. When I was at Mattel in the mid 80s, uh, on a whim, I ran a feature, it was about four pages, of letters from children uh, to the company, uh, talking about their Hot Wheels and their Barbies and their Masters of the Universe and the like, and it was the most popular thing we ever did. Um, hearing, you know, from the end user, if, if you will. Uh, and you know, most employees never actually have contact with the customer. Uh, and Giving them that connection, I think, is important, but I don't talk to a lot of organizations that do that. It's interesting. We've just mentioned healthcare organizations. Medtronic does that up in the Twin Cities as well. Yeah. Well, one of the dimensions I think that is important to talk about as we uh, come down to 15 minutes or so left uh, in the broadcast, and by the way, one more uh, Note to uh, people who are watching in real time, if you have questions, please ask them. You can do that right here on the Hangout. Uh, it's active, uh, so just ask a question or post it on Twitter using the hashtag IABCfellows. Uh, but is it possible to deliver a great customer experience when employees are not having a great uh, employee experience? If, if you have a population of largely not engaged or actively disengaged employees, uh, how great can the customer experience be? Even if the culture is driven around the customer, um, how anxious are employees going to be to deliver on that promise to customers? You're going to pay a heavy, heavy price to be able to do that. And oftentimes what happens is that the uh, customer or the employees start to sabotage the customer, which is even worse. When, when they're being mistreated, I mean, I'm thinking of the days in General Motors and Ford back 20, 30 years ago, uh, when they actually were uh, doing damage to the cars before they got off the assembly line because they were so pissed off at their bosses. Yeah, I was going to say, sometimes I think it's a uh, short-term success that um, is, it's definitely not worth the doing. And I think one of the things that we have to do is remind people it's sort of the, there is, it's, you have to have that long-term vision on everything that you're doing and the uh, Again, maybe communications people can remind folks of the history um, and the importance of looking at this not just of quarterly profits. It's it's really you know we want to earn a customer for life and um, really make sure that that relationship works no matter where the touch points are. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's really difficult for every employee to have that uh, connection with the customer because many people and large organizations don't deal with customers on a day-to-day -day basis and so how can you create that uh, I, mean, I I just got back from having been at two trade shows and I think you know as a communications person I part of my time was working the booth and doing some stuff but the other part was going out and listening and hearing 
you know, what it is that customers and potential customers are really saying, what's the buzz, what are their pain points, and then being able to use my communication skills to be able to translate some of the things that we're doing into addressing some of those issues. So I'd say sort of no matter where you fit in an organization, whether it's in communications or you know, in another job, anywhere, you, you probably need to find ways to get close to customers. We have, I've, I've seen lots of companies put in ride-along programs where you might take somebody from R&D who normally isn't out there hearing customers and pair them with a salesperson or two and go and call on a customer and use that opportunity to educate them as to the business side of things and the realities in the real world, get them out of their development tower and experience what it is that uh, you know that's that's being said about them and what the competitors are doing and sort of that bigger picture real world view of things and um, I, I would say you know to anybody if it's not sort of a part of your job if it's not on the description that was given to you the day you walked in find a way to do that and make it a part of your job to understand these audiences and get out and about and hear things and don't just be beholden to the oh we've decided that the message is this I think there's that um, you know. Well, that may be the message that we would like to convey. What is it that customers want to hear, and what is it that people are saying about us? And we're the ones who have to take that and sort of triangulate these things and come up with the message that resonates across all these constituent audiences. You, you talk about getting the R and D people, for example, out of their offices and and with the customer. I think it's equally important for executives to do that. They're up in the uh, the C suite, uh, not. Talk, I mean, you know, they meet occasionally with, with big customers, but Avis, I remember, I don't know if they still do this, but uh, the executives were required once a quarter to go work a rental counter uh, so that you can, you know, you can talk about how important it is to give great service to the customer at the rental counter, but if you don't personally understand the, the obstacles and the challenges there, it, it's, it's tough to provide the kind of support uh, that they need in, in order to deliver that kind of an experience to the customer. Well, and many companies also have, in the sort of the B2B world, the executives are assigned to different accounts. So they're like the senior, and you know, whether they pay a visit once a year, sometimes it's that CEO to CEO sales and discussions at this level that then manifest themselves and wake, make their way through the organizations, sometimes painfully slowly down to the front line where it gets to the transaction stage. But... Um, you're right. In fact, I think that's one of the things that, uh, again, we can help shape is make sure that the executives are talking about their customer encounters and what it is that they're hearing. Um, you know, if, if you're sitting in a group that may be remote, make sure that the, the voice of the customer comes through loud and clear in the communications. Yeah, one of the things we talked about is the idea of uh, the communicator providing the insight, uh, even access to the customer. What else can employee communicators do? One of the things that, that jumps to my mind is is the idea of recognizing employees who are doing a great job uh, of delivering on the customer experience. Uh, you know, my view of recognition in an organization has always been that it's targeted not at the people you're recognizing, but at everybody else to say this is the kind of behavior that earns recognition around here. So the, the idea of recognition is to modify everybody else's behavior. So um, can we tell the stories about the people who are uh, delivering great service? Can we surface those stories and, and sort of introduce them into the storytelling culture of the, of the company? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, um, Shell. I think the other thing that, that the communication people can be doing is building the capability to do that inside the organization. I think it's the leader's responsibility also to recognize and reward people and for the communication people to guide and to coach the leadership about how to do that, how to do that around the right things and how to do more of it. So I think there's a do-it role, but there's also a coaching and teaching role that communication people can play. George, I'm wondering, uh, uh, among your clients, how does uh, employee communications fit into the whole customer experience uh, scenario? Well, it, you know, it's critical, and it's it's not just the communications directed for the, from the center, but it's in encouraging people to sort of always be gathering this feedback from the field and bubbling it in. So, for example... Brad mentioned the case of the trade show, which is a great example. I just covered a trade show with a client recently where I spent a lot of time on their booth, 
and as they were having conversations and getting feedback from uh, from customers at their booth about their different product offerings and getting into discussions about different solutions, somebody on the sales team in the booth was like tweeting that all back to the company. So it was getting distributed inter internally on uh, on chatter to people inside inside their sales organization, live as the people were getting the input from the booth and getting a lot of conversations fostered around, hey, this is how we could fine tune our product offering to deal with these 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 issues or these needs. So uh, I think it goes back to what Jim was just saying a couple of minutes ago. It's not just communicators stuffing us creating content from the center or messages from the center. It's making sure we can facilitate these conversations and create help that we that we've got these channels so that people on the front lines can be feeding this information into us. And it's in a form that we can have get actionable information. Once a customer has a great experience, if they talk about it, is there something that uh, we can do to help spread that? Uh, you know, once that has has been surfaced, I mean, it can sit there on Facebook and and affect somebody's close circle of friends who happen to see it before it scrolled off the news feed. Should we be looking for those good reviews that come from a great experience and helping to amplify them? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, in fact, I think part of our job is part of our job is to be cheerleaders for some of this stuff too. When you see the good one, share it. Um, I, I just did this this morning. Uh, sort of a thank you note to a team that had done some work internally on behalf of a customer. Then I made sure that their management team was aware of that. And I think that that whole idea of recognition for a job well done. Um, to help a customer sh should be as much a part of everybody's DNA as is doing a good job in and of itself. So uh, you know you're you're right, and you know we do this um, on behalf of the customer, but also like you said, Shell, the rewards thing is to send a signal to everybody else. The more signals we can send out, I think, the better. I think the other piece is just to encourage others to do this. Um, you know, I keep thinking that uh, you know the the role of the communicator used to be to put you know all this stuff on our own shoulders to go and do it, but I think the new role is how do we get others to do what it is that we would do if we had the time and could be everywhere, and we're giving them the tools that heretofore had been exclusively ours. I mean, the fact that you can now carry around you know a broadcast quality video camera, you can do your own broadcasts. You don't necessarily need the corporate communications people to do it. Um, you you know you can tweet, you can jabber, you can have all sorts of instant messaging things that again before were exclusively ours. We need to do that empowerment. We need to encourage. We need to set the environment. We can help set up some of the rules and and help shape it. But what we really want to do is have others help us do their job, which is our job, which is everybody's job. Uh, Brad, Brad I, I totally uh, agree with you. I think that is such an important point. I think there are two things from this conversation. Number one is, it, yes, we all have to be doers. All of us are doers. But we also have tremendous opportunity to coach people, to teach people, to build the capability of the organization to communicate better because the communication capability it has a, a strategic advantage. Second thing is, is again, uh, we all have to do it. But if we're going to do it, the more we can do it out in the field, out where the money gets made, in the sales force or in the manufacturing or the R&D, help people do their jobs better by getting rid of communication break breakdowns that are causing people to underperform. When we do that and we our investment in doing that is smaller than the gain we create, we are starting to add value. And I think communication people have tremendous opportunities to add more value by doing just that. Hey, hey, we got a question uh, from Sharon McIntosh. Uh, Hi, Sharon. <laughs> uh, a great question, by the way. How would you measure the effectiveness of employee communications connection to the customer? Connection to the customer. Or the impact that employee communications is having on delivering on the customer experience. If 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 I'm going to assume that this is one of my roles as a as a manager of internal communications, how do I measure how well I'm doing at supporting uh, the delivery of the customer experience? Well, I, I think that's the the issue of value that I was talking about. We we did uh, quite a bit of work with FedEx a few years ago 
where they were wanting to increase export volume and we started with a pilot in Los Angeles and it was headed by the employee communication people but it also included operations, sales, HR, Six Sigma, etc. Over a period of four months we addressed three major communication issues. The internal communication people, Terry Simpson, was leading that and as a result of that there was a six point one million dollar improvement in revenues over four months and a fourteen hundred and forty seven percent return on investment, meaning the cost of that project was much, much smaller than the returns that the communication people were able to gain. They took it to five more locations and had a $6.1 million increase and almost a 1,700% return. On-time delivery, I mentioned earlier on, uh, in the Lubbock operation that Courtney Reynolds, who's now at Northwestern Mutual, did, was a significant return on investment from, from what we spent to what we got back in terms of sales. So there are tremendous opportunities if we get involved in the operation of the business to help improve the operation be able to, to account for it. And I think you sort of hit it a little bit earlier, Jim, when you sort of questioned this customer satisfaction rating that Cisco uses to help figure out a bonus for an average employee. That's a real squishy measure. That's just sort of like the what it, you can't really measure the ROI because you don't know how much it's costing you and how much you're doing it. And one of the things that you've always done so well is gotten down to the let's get it to an actionable area where we can measure and you put some metrics around it. I think the best you could do if you're really just looking at is there a correlation between employee communications and employees you know satisfaction engagement and customer satisfaction um, you're not going to get much further than that and it's the, it's the traditional problem that I think many communications people and many marketing people have that I think their bosses are always looking for that causal relationship cause and effect and all we can really generally hope for on a lot of things is over time we can show that they're correlated and how strong the correlation is, but ROI is best measured around a specific incident, a specific project, uh, something that has some bounds on it where you know the number's coming in and the number's going out. So a great question, and mine would be if you're really just looking for the general, you can come up with some metrics, but they may not be as meaningful as the ones that some managers are looking for. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree with you, Brad. I think I think it's important. I, I'm giving an IABC speech upcoming here. This is do more that matters, and what I'm talking about is starting to shift from uh, counting activity, measuring activity, and start counting results, measure results. And the more that we can start showing that for this amount of money, we got this kind of return. I don't care how many hits, engagement, click-throughs, and all that. Did they sell any beer? Did they sell any whatever? Was the was there a gross margin that was acceptable? So increasingly, I think communication people have got to get into the business of the business, and there's tremendous opportunities because other communication people are showing that they're winning with it. We can ask, though, right? I mean, if you're looking for some sort of a metric, we we can ask employees if if we're helping with the content that we're delivering and the programs that are that we have in place. Are are these useful in helping you? deliver on the customer experience. I mean, it can sure. certainly help us tweak what we're doing, but we can take that back to management that may be wondering about the value of internal communications uh, and, and say, look, employees think that uh, what we are delivering is enabling and empowering them to deliver on the experience. Mm -hmm. I've been in many training programs where at the end, part of the evaluation is the content that you just learned, are you going to be able to use it in your daily interactions with customers? How much of the content? And, and so there are ways to get at some, some metrics around here. It's interesting because I think when I, th I think about our role, it seems to me that it is the business that Jim is talking about. And we've also talked about how important it is to have that culture. And it's sort of a dual responsibility. We have to have that environment in place. And I think we're at least a contributor or a steward in some of that because we look at these various constituent audiences and also the uh, the hands-on part of the business and if we have to give a trade-off I love what you're saying Jim of the you know sometimes maybe we don't have to worry as much about the how many of this and how many press releases uh, uh, I've often said in some organizations getting a press release out is a pain and we should never let a press release stand in the way of good communications <laughs> what we do is focus on the real communication that takes place because uh, 
harder to measure, harder to do, but so much more impactful. Yeah, I, I remember my first job. I was a press, sec press secretary to the governor of Kansas, and uh, I was used to all that activity measure, and then somebody reminded me it happened to be the governor. He says, you know, it really matters most what happens on November 4th, <laughs> not all the activity. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I've been involved in a benchmarking project on uh, internal communications in large organizations, and if there is a trend I have detected from talking to these internal communication leaders is that the senior internal communicator is increasingly being handed responsibility for culture uh, or for uh, engagement. It's, it's literally their titles, communication and engagement or communication and culture. Uh, and, and I think that's a positive move when HR has traditionally been seen as the owner of these things for communicators to be handed the uh, responsibility for it uh, tells me something. And that leads us to the uh, end of our time. It's um, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so I want to thank you, gents, for uh, taking the time and, and having the conversation. I think it's been terrific. Thank you. It's been fun. Sharon, thanks for your question. <laughs> And I always find that when you get on a panel like this, I learn as much, if not more, than what I'm able to contribute. So uh, thanks to my panelists. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, one of the reasons I love doing this along with my podcast is I get to spend an hour, hour and a half with really smart people I learn from. So uh, thanks very much. And we'll be back in May. We don't have a date yet, but we'll get that published as soon as we do to talk about creativity and innovation in communications. That should be a fun one, too. So Thank, we'll you, see you, Thank you, Shell. Thank you, Shell. Bet Jim, George, Brad, thanks. Thanks, Shell. Thanks.